Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 47, please. Remain standing for the reading of the word of the Lord. I was reading just in my Bible reading this morning, and uh, this chapter stood out to me, this passage in this chapter stood out to me, so here we go. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter 47, I feel like the Lord laid this on my heart, I feel like it's in the same vein of where we're at as a youth group and what God's been doing. Verse 1, I'm reading the New Living, it'll be on the screen. If you've got KJV, you're probably more spiritual than me, but anyway... Uh, Ezekiel 47, verse 1, it says, In my vision, the man brought me back to the entrance of the temple. The past several chapters, Ezekiel's been having his grand vision of a temple that will be built. And theologians debate as to which temple this actually is, if it's something future, if it's something that's been built. Most say it's future. But anyway, like future to even us now. Anyway, he's been having this grand vision of this incredible temple, and so he's being directed by this man, and and the man brings him back to the entrance of the temple, and he says, There I saw a stream flowing east from beneath the door of the temple and passing to the right of the altar on its south side. The man brought me outside the wall through the north gateway and led me around to the eastern entrance, and there I could see the water flowing out through the south side of the east gateway. Now, the next uh, three verses... That's when Ezekiel talks about you know, going out into the river and the water being to his ankles and then to his knees and then to his waist and then waters to swim in. That's this chapter. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read that. That's not where we're going. But verse 6, uh, the man that has been guiding him, he says, Ezekiel, have you, have you been watching, son of man? And then he led me back along the bank of this river. And when I returned, I was surprised. You say, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. And then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert. Somebody say, through the desert. Into the valley of the Dead Sea. The waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things wherever the water of this river flows. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever... This water flows. Fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea all the way from Engedi to Eglaim. The shores will be covered with nets drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea just like they fill the Mediterranean. But the marshes and the swamps, they will not be purified. They will be salty still. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow along both sides of the river. Sounds pretty lush. The leaves of these trees will never turn brown and fall, and there will always be fruit on their branches. There will be a new crop every month, for they are watered by the river flowing from the temple. The fruit will be for food and the leaves for healing. I, uh, I'm going to tell you this. Um, this morning I was at the clinic. I've been diagnosed with tonsillitis and pharyngitis, and I told him I was a I, I worked at a church. He assumed I was a preacher. And he said, oh, you, you'll be good. You don't have to preach until Sunday. <laughs> I never told him the difference. So I'm not really supposed to be doing this right now. And I wish I had, like, I wasn't really singing very loud or shouting very loud because I didn't want to ruin my voice and it's starting to get a little sore. Um, I wish I had about ten times the voice or maybe five times the voice that I'm going to have for the remainder of the message. <laughs> so if you could do me a favor... And if you could shout really loud throughout the whole sermon and say amen really loud and clap your hands like quite often, that would really, that would really, really help. Yeah. Yeah, I'll do this and you say amen and you shout, okay? I want to preach tonight for a little while on the subject, let the river flow. Look at your neighbor and tell them, command them, come on, say it, let the river flow. Let's pray before we are seated tonight. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word that we're about to look into. We thank you for the life-giving power of your word. I'm praying, Jesus, that you'd bring revelation and insight into everything that is said and done for the remainder of this, this time together that we have in your presence. Praying that your spirit would saturate it. And we pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Everyone say in Jesus' name. And you can be seated. Amen. Um, How many of you are in high school right now? Raise your hand, please. 
How many of you have taken a biology class in high school? Raise your hand, please. I think this is high school curriculum, if I recall correctly. I'm not sure, but um, have you guys ever been taught about spontaneous generation? Yeah? What grade is that? Is that 11th grade curriculum? Okay. 11th grade biology class. If you've been there, we're going back. If you haven't been there, we're going there right now. But there was this concept that floated around um, you know, throughout the ages of history and in, in science back in the Middle Ages, you know, uh, I say Middle Ages, I'm talking you know, 14, 15, 1600s, around that time frame. And people believed that uh, life could spontaneously generate, it could come out of thin air, it could just happen. And uh, that was just kind of a common idea. The reason they thought it was because, you know, uh, whatever, rotting pieces of food or flesh, uh, it would grow maggots and, you know, mold would grow on these sorts of things. And, and so they just thought that life could just happen because, you know, different molds and bacteria, it is alive. Um, and they didn't know a cause. And so they just said it must come out of nowhere. And so there was these different scientists and uh, people throughout uh, scientific history that would try to debunk these theories. And there was two guys in particular that that you learn about in 11th grade biology class, unless this table's lying to me right here. Uh, I remember learning this. I thought it was 10th grade. I still am not sure about these guys. But anyway, there was two guys. One was Francesco, or Francisco, it's, it's C-E-S, Reddy, R-E-D-I. You guys ever heard about this guy? Okay, so y you guys are in high school. I don't even need to take my time here. But basically, he did the experiment where he put... Uh, pieces of meat in three different kinds of jars, right? One was wide open to the air, one was completely sealed off, and one had just like a, a net covering, a, a mesh on the top. And, um, you know, people thought that in order for life to spontaneously generate, there needed to be air. And so, you know, he let that be a component in two of the jars. And what he found was that in the open jar, maggots formed on the meat. In the completely sealed jar, no maggots, because there's no air. And that's what people thought, right? Of course, there's no maggots, there's no air. In the third ex uh, experiment with the mesh, the maggots formed on top of the mesh, but not on the meat. How interesting. So that was Francisco Reddy. The people, they thought his experiment was, you know, really cool, but not complete because, again, there's no air. We need air to prove that, you know, anyway, it was, it was not good enough. So another guy comes along, and his name, does anybody know it? <laughs> Louis Pasteur. Not like the guy that I am. Like, not pastor, but pasteur. Is that, is that French for pastor? Pasteur? Okay, just calm down. Louis Pasteur. He did another experiment. And he, next slide, please. Uh, he did an experiment where he had two different flasks. This was one of them. Uh, this is called the gooseneck or the swan neck, I think, flask. And, and the other flask he had was just like a straight up flask with a you know, tubular thing on top of the bulbous. And he put broth in them, and he boiled both of the broths, broths and he, uh, so, do I even need to explain the rest of this experiment? The, the microbes did not form in this one, because even though there was air there, the, the molecules would not be able to fall down into the broth, because they would have to go down the tube and back up the tube, and it didn't happen, proving that life does not just spontaneously generate, whether it be on a, you know, a maggot level or on a microbial level, it does not spontaneously generate. And we understand that as, as believers. We understand that the only way that life can spontaneously generate is when the hand of God and the Word of God is involved. We believe that uh, there is a Creator. We didn't just come here by accident. These things were disproven in the 1500s and people still debate it. Man, people are silly, you know what I'm saying? But anyway, I want to preach tonight about a God that is able, just like He did in creation, to spontaneously generate life where life seems impossible. These guys proved that, that it was impossible for life to just spring up like people thought. But when it comes to God, God is able to speak and all of a sudden life can just out of the blue and, and in an instant can just begin to spring up in any given place that He sees fit. 
All through the Bible, we, ha- we have examples of things like this, and this is not an exhaustive list, but you read through stories like the story of Abraham and Sarah in Genesis chapter 18. God promised Abraham that he would have descendants that were, they, they would be innumerable and they would be a great nation. And uh, he promises this to Abraham. He tells it to Sarah and Sarah laughs because Sarah's too old to have children. She is well stricken in years, the Bible says, and, and her uh, child rearing baby making days are over. She's old and she's barren. But we know the story and we know that God caused an old, barren woman to conceive and she gave birth to a son. Somebody say life. Life. Where it seemed barren, God said, no, I'm going to bring forth life. And then there was life. There are eight documented resurrection miracles in the Bible. Nine if you count the resurrection of Jesus. And I'm I'm going to read about them to you. In 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah was used by God to raise to life the widow of Zarephath's son. In 2 Kings chapter 4, Elisha, the successor of Elijah, he was used by God to raise the Shunammite woman's son. And even after he's dead, Elisha was still being used by God in this way. There were some guys trying to dispose of a, of a dead body, trying to bury him, and they had to do it quickly. And so they, they come across the, the tomb of Elisha. They throw this corpse in there, and as soon as the corpse touches the bones of the dead prophet, that corpse springs to life in an instant. Jesus was involved in three resurrection miracles in the Gospels. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus raised to life the widow of Nain's son. Literally, He turned a funeral procession into a party. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus goes to Jairus' house and He raises Jairus' daughter back to life from the dead. In John chapter 11, Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus of Bethany and He calls out and He says, Lazarus, come forth. And here comes old Laz hobbling out of the tombstone, still bound in his grave clothes, but where he once was dead for a few days and the Bible said that he stunk, he still was able to come forth from the grave. In Acts chapter 9, Peter, he, he was used by God to raise Tabitha from the dead. In Acts chapter 20, Paul is preaching late Eutychus is sitting on on the window ledge. He falls to the ground dead. Paul goes down, embraces him, and prays him back to life. All through the Bible, resurrection miracles. Jesus was raised to life of His own power after three days in the grave. And then if you go to Matthew 27, this one I I didn't mention in the 8 or the 9, but Matthew 27, it tells us that when Jesus died on the cross and after He was resurrected, There were many graves that were open and the bodies of many dead saints. Let me say many. The Bible is very specific. Many dead saints rose to life. And so we don't even know how many resurrections are in the Bible. It could be dozens. It could be hundreds. Depending on how many were in Matthew 27. But God is a God that is able to take a circumstance that looks lifeless and He is able to speak a word and bring life where once there was desolation where once it seemed absolutely bleak and hopeless, God can speak a word and cause life to spring up. Ezekiel chapter 37, last example. This is where the prophet is standing before the valley of dry bones. So we say dry bones. You know, when somebody first dies, it's not just a skeleton laying in a casket, right? They've still got the flesh. They've still got the skin, the muscle. It's all lifeless, but it's there. This was bones. It had, it had had enough time for all of the flesh and muscle and sinew and tissue and skin to rot away. But it's even longer than that because inside the bones of any human body, there's marrow. And marrow takes longer to dry out and to disintegrate. But these bones were completely dry. It tells me that they've been sitting there for quite some time. It had been a long time since life had been in these, in these bones. But God speaks to the prophet and He says, Son of man, can these bones live? And the prophet, he doesn't even know what to say. He goes, you know. (laughs) Thou knowest. And then a wind begins to blow. And then these bones begin to come together and form skeletal structures. And then tissues and sinews and muscles begin to form around these structures. And then skin begins to enclose them. And suddenly, there's a great army standing before the prophet. 
Because the God we serve is in the business of taking things that look barren and bleak, desolate and dead, and causing them to flourish with life. Come on, are you thankful that's the God we serve tonight? That even though it's lifeless and dead, that God can speak a word and then life can come in an instant. Whenever the Spirit of God moves upon something, new life, it will spring up. We see it in the Scripture and, it's, and it holds true today. doesn't matter what you, you've come in here facing, what you walk through on a daily basis in your life. If you have barrenness in your life, if you go into bleak circumstances or desolate circumstances, you can get a word from God and life can spring forth. In our text, in Ezekiel chapter 47, Ezekiel, he's having a vision of a river. And we read how wherever the river flowed, that life came. Wherever the river flowed, life sprung forth. Verse 6 of that passage, it says, He asked me, have you been watching, son of man? And he led me back along the riverbank. And when I returned, I was surprised by the sight of so many trees growing on both sides of the river. Somebody say trees. There was vegetation and, and life that was flourishing alongside the river. And this is interesting to me. Then the man said, this river flows east through the desert. So we say the desert. So we've got a river in a place where really a river should not be. We've got trees growing in a place where trees normally would not grow. I've come to say that even in the midst of a dry desolate and barren place, there is a river that can begin to flow. And if the river is allowed to flow, then things can begin to grow. No one would expect to see trees growing in the desert. No wonder Ezekiel said he was surprised. It shocked him. It, it wasn't something he was expecting to see. A desert represents desolation and deadness. No one expects life to come forth in a desert. The environment is too harsh. The conditions are not conducive. But if the river is allowed to flow, then life can spring forth and things can begin to grow. I'm reminded of what the prophet Isaiah spoke in Isaiah 43 and 19. God said, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and I will cause rivers in the desert. Not where rivers are expected. Not in the Fredericton Valley. <laughs> you know, we kind of expect to see a river there. It's a valley. The, the land is all set and ready for the water to flow through. We expect it there. We expect it near lush places and places where there's bodies of water surrounding it. But in a desert, God said, I'll cause rivers to flow in the desert. I've come to remind somebody about the river that flows. And I want to remind somebody that this river is not some way out there somewhere force. It's not something cerebral. But rather it is something very close and nigh to each and every one of us in this place. Because the river of living water is something that flows from within. It comes from the deepest part of your soul. Jesus said, He that believeth on Me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now we don't have to guess what it is. He's talking about the Spirit which they that believe on Him should receive. Not could receive, but should receive. That's very important. He's talking about the Spirit of God. And He said it's going to come from, with, from within your belly. Out from your belly. The innermost part of your being. He's the source of it. But you are the conduit through which it flows. Can I tell somebody that if you have the Holy Ghost, there is a life-giving fountain on the inside of you that you can take into the most barren and desolate desert and you can begin to see life to spring up all around you? Come on, it flows from the inside of you. A few weeks ago, I, we preached about and, and God challenged us about digging out our wells. You Remember that message? Just while I open this water, look at your neighbor and say, dig out your well, bro. Amen. 
If it's not a bro, you can say, girl. I'm sorry. But a few weeks ago, God challenged us to dig out our, our spiritual wells and allow the fountain, of, uh, the fountain to spring up in our life. John 4.14, 4, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him. Somebody say, in him. Amen. It's going to be in him a well of water springing up, springing forth, flowing out into life everlasting. Again, I'm saying to somebody tonight that, that you are the conduit that God allows this river of life to flow through. If we don't let it flow, it's not going to flow. If it's not bubbling up from our soul every day of our life, everywhere that we go, it's not flowing in the places that we frequent. We're the conduit. We are the bridge for this world that is desolate and barren and dry to have the waters of life flowing into it. We are that bridge. We're the conduit. It doesn't matter what the surroundings look like. It doesn't matter the level of desolation. Things might look barren. Things might look dead. Perhaps there's never been any life there before. But if we can just as individuals and as a collective continue to let the river of living water flow out of our soul and into our world, then God can cause life to begin to spring up spontaneously and in a moment. God can do a quick work, but He's got to let that river flow through His people. I don't know what surroundings you walk in on a daily basis, but just let that river flow. Just let that fountain of living water begin to spring up into life everlasting in your school, in your home, in your bedroom at night when you're praying and seeking God. Everywhere you go, when you, when you go to work, when you're walking downtown, just let that river flow. I know that we've got P7 tomorrow, and, and I, I hope that I can make it. If I can't, carry on without me. But man, I'm telling you, I've been to Leo Hayes. I attended that school. I've attended both high schools, actually. Went to classes in both. And I've, I've visited both in years since. We had P7 the past couple of years, and I've been there. And I know that the, the high school I graduated from, Leo Hayes, I, I've heard people say it, and I can even sense it, that in some ways it's a more secular environment than even Fredericton High School. I've heard people say that. There's a lot of really left-wing crazy people that work and attend that high school, work at and attend that high school. There's people with all kinds of agendas that try to cram their junk down your throats and make you do things that, you know, you don't want to do. Make you learn things that really you don't need to learn. Make you practice and play out scenarios that are just stupid. Have these special days and try to get you to wear crazy clothes to support stupid agendas. It's a liberal school, and I know, and I'm not being you know, disrespectful to the people. To the ideas, yes. I'll spit on them, I'll, I'll jump up and down on those ideas, but, you know, it's a harsh environment. Can you agree? The world in general is a harsh environment. But God said, if you'll just let the river flow, you'll begin to look around and you'll begin to see trees on the banks of that river. In a place where you never thought that trees could grow. In a place where you never thought that life could be possible, if you'll let the river flow, then you'll begin to see things begin to grow around you. Even in the harshest of environments, it doesn't matter. That's no match for the river of living water that comes from the life of a sold-out, blood-bought child of the King. Come on, you've got something on the inside of you. You have no idea the power that is resident on the inside of your life. You've just got to let it out. Let it flow and see what God will do. I want to encourage some P7 Club member, you don't need to stop that. Don't let the enemy discourage you. I know it's a harsh environment. I know it seems dead and desolate. And it maybe seems like nobody wants what you've got. But just let your river flow anyway. Come on, even in the desolation, let it flow. And see things begin to grow. And life spring forth. Amen. We read on in the passage, verse 8. The man said to Ezekiel, he said this river flows through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. So we say the Dead Sea. 
the waters of this river, this stream, they will make the, wa- the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh. And they will make these salty waters pure. We've talked about the Dead Sea before, but the Dead Sea is one of the harshest environments for marine life on the planet. They've got a few pictures to show you of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is located at the southern end of the Jordan River geographically. And all of the water from the Jordan and other bodies of water further upstream, they end up flowing into the Dead Sea. Everything ends up right there. All the water flows in, but what makes the Dead Sea unique, and we've talked about this, is that there's no outlet for the water to flow out. If you're a water molecule in the Dead Sea, the only way you're getting out of there is if you evaporate out of there. You're going up. You're not going out, you're going up. (laughs) There's no outlet. And because of this, over thousands of years, minerals and sediment have built up in the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea just so happens to be one of the saltiest bodies of water on the planet because of it. It has a 34.2% salinity, which is 9.6 times the salt content of the ocean. All of this sediment, it just sits there. All of this salt, it just sits there. And it prevents life from flourishing. As its name would suggest, the Dead Sea has no life. It's absolutely dead. You're not going to find any underwater vegetation like seaweed. It's not gonna, you're not going to find it. It doesn't exist. You're not going to find any fish. You're not going to find any sharks. You're not going to find any seahorses or anything else you might find underwater. I don't know why I thought of seahorses, but they're not there. If it's alive, you're not going to find it in the Dead Sea. You're not going to find it. It's desolate. desolate. It's barren. It's dead. But Ezekiel saw the river in his vision begin to flow not just through the desert, but he saw it begin to flow into the Dead Sea. And when it did, he said in verse 8 that the waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. The river I'm talking about tonight, it has the ability to change the harshest of environments into one that is conducive and ripe for revival and harvest and life. I feel like I need to say that again. But the river that I'm preaching about tonight, when it begins to flow into an environment that once was harsh and desolate and did not support life, when it begins to flow, it it begins to change it into one that is conducive for revival. I feel like we can clap and we can shout about that for a second. Come on, anybody have an amen in your heart tonight? I believe that. He said in verse 9 that there will be swarms of living things. Wherever the water of this river flows, fish will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever this water will flow. Fishermen will stand along the shores of the Dead Sea. People that would never be there in times previous. They had no need to be there. There's no fish there. But now, because the river has come, now there's people that are working the harvest and there are people that are gathering in the fish all along the shore, all the way from En Gedi to En Eglame. The shores will be covered with the nets of these fishermen drying in the sun. Fish of every kind will fill the Dead Sea. Somebody say life. Life. Just like they fill the Mediterranean. Listen, I believe that there are harvest fields that we have yet to tap into. I believe that there are places that we thought for the longest time have been locked up and beyond our reach. Up to now, there's been no life. It's been desolate and it's been dead. But there is a flow that I believe that we've been been tapping into the past few weeks as we've been digging out the well and we've been allowing that spring of living water to spring up in our soul. There's There's a flow that we've tapped into the past little while. There's a fountain that we're rediscovering in our lives. And as that begins to flow from us as vessels of the Most High God, we step into our schools and into this world. And even in the harshest of environments, life can begin to spring forth. And God can begin to set up a harvest. Trees and vegetation can grow. Life and, 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 you know, like in the Dead Sea, marine life can begin to, to flourish and come forth. All because of the river. 
And I feel like what God is saying tonight to all of us, our responsibility is to just let that river, river flow. So we say, let it flow. Because if we can let it flow, as we tap into the Spirit of God, as we delve deeper into the things of God, allowing that living water to flow from within, as we pray in the Holy Ghost, allowing His Spirit to make intercession for us, as we go deeper and see that spring gush up stronger and let that river flow into our world, a great harvest and a great revival will come. Our responsibility is to not block the flow and just let it go. Let it flow. Don't, don't, don't let up on what we've been doing. Don't grow weary in well-doing. I know it's hard sometimes to fast some distractions. I know sometimes it's hard to set aside time and pray and seek the face of God. I know that that's challenging sometimes. But God is saying, don't you dare stop the flow that's begun. Because when we let the flow go, a harvest will spring up. Life will spring up. Even in a place where we thought maybe it could never come. I'm going to ask the music to come back. I'm, I'm almost done. It's 8 o'clock. Thank you for listening and thank you for preaching with me. I don't know what desolation you live in. We all have areas of our life that look barren and dry and dead. I've already mentioned our schools. All of us that are in school, unless you go to Bible school, hopefully this is not the case. But all of us that attend school, and our world is, is backward and messed up. It's worldly and, and just rank with sin. We see it every day. And it can be so easy to believe the lie of the enemy that he has the upper hand and that, and that things are just dead and it's always going to be dead. It's just a desert. Just a desert. Nothing you can do about it. You can't plant trees in the desert. You can't have fish or you can't have a, a catch in the Dead Sea. It's too harsh, too desolate, too barren. I think we can all relate to that desolation. But it really doesn't matter if, that, if there's something else. Maybe you go to a home where there's desolation and barrenness and there's no life there. There's no spiritual life. Maybe you serve God by yourself. I, I can understand how tough that would be. It's easy when we're in the midst of desolation to just think it's always going to be this way. I've tried to plant a seed, to water it. I've tried and it doesn't grow. It's too dry. It's too, it's too dead here. I just really feel that, that what God is trying to get us to do in this season of going deeper, seeking after God, it's really about letting the Holy Ghost flow through us on a daily basis. When I say the river, I'm talking about the Spirit of the living God every day, everywhere we go, every place, every scenario. Just let it flow. Let the river flow. The river flows when we dig down deep to the reservoirs under the surface, which we've talked about. Really, the message tonight is to just keep on digging so that we can, we can keep on seeing it flow from within. The Spirit of the living God. And whatever the desolation, you can begin to see life, not because you're so great or so talented, not because you know every scripture in the Bible, but you'll begin to see life because the Holy Ghost is flowing in and through you. Because the river of living water is flowing through your life. Desolation diminishes when the river flows. I know it's a simple message tonight, but it's what the Lord is has laid upon my heart for us. I want you to stand with me. I have one more scripture. Really the challenge is to just keep on going deeper. Keep on digging deeper. Keep on seeking the Lord. You know, Paul said that I pray in tongues more than you all. He said when I come into the house of God, I'll pray in, with the understanding. I'll pray in, in English. I'll pray in the, you know, the language of the people for the benefit of the people. But man, when I get all by myself, 
I begin to pray in the Spirit and I delve deep into the things of God. Paul knew what it was to see that river flow in his life. And it seems like everywhere he went, everything he did, everything he touched, it seemed to flourish. Man, he was a church planner. Paul was the man that knew what it was to have the river of living water flow on a daily basis. It's like Midas. Everything he touched would turn to gold. Paul had the, the river flowing and everything he touched, it would just life spring it up. Powerful man of God. And you can be that too. You can be a, a powerful man or woman of God in this generation. you got to let the river of God flow. My last verse tonight, it's Luke chapter 5. In verse 4, because I believe that God is going to send a harvest and a revival. I believe that it's happening. I believe that as we go out into our schools and you know, other places of deadness and desolation, God, if we'll let that water flow, God will begin to, we'll see life spring up. We'll see a harvest become white and ready. It's out there. We just, we just got to water it with the Spirit flowing through us. Luke chapter 5, verse 4, it says, now when they, he had left speaking, Jesus is in a boat with Simon Peter. He's been teaching the crowds on the shore, and now he's done. And he says to Simon, he says, launch out into the deep. Somebody say the deep. And after you get out into the deep, then let down your nets for a draught. Peter said, man, we've been doing this all night long. You have no idea, Jesus. It hasn't worked yet. We've had a Kind of a barren night last night. No catch, no fish, no harvest, if you will. Jesus said, you know what, if you want to catch, if you want to have a draught, that word, it, it means a haul. H-A-U-L. That's a big catch. He said, if you want to have a big catch, go out into the deep. Could it be that the level of the catch the size of the harvest is directly connected to the depth of our walk with God. I feel like the Lord is saying to us, I want to give you a harvest and I want it to be a big harvest. Bigger than what you could imagine. But you got to keep going deeper. you got to keep going deeper. We understand the deeper we go, the more the Holy Ghost can flow the more the Spirit of God can minister through us to people in the world that we live in. Come on, the Holy Ghost is challenging somebody to not throw down what we've picked up in the past few weeks, but just carry it forward. Push it through a little bit more. Keep on going deeper. Because if you'll go out into the deep, Jesus said, I'll give you a catch. It's going to be a big catch. Don't go back to the shallow waters. Keep digging. Keep digging and let the river flow. I pray that you've received the word of God tonight. I wonder if you can lift your hands and if you can just lift up your voice with those hands. Come on, some of you have been getting a hold of this. There's a new touch of God on your life that you've never had before. The Holy Ghost has been flowing through your life in a powerful way. And God is saying, I'm going to use that in the desolation of your world. I'm going to use that in the deadness of your high school to cause life to spring up. To cause a harvest to become white and ready. It's going to happen because a young person wasn't content to go back to the shallow end of the pool, but they're going to continue to press on into the deep things of God. Let the fountain of the deep spring up through them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I really don't have any voice left. It's sore. Can you lift up your voice? Kind of help me out. Hallelujah, Let it flow. Let it flow. Let it flow. 
This is what I'm talking about. Just keep letting that thing flow. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Let rivers of living water spring up. And not just here in this room, but everywhere you go. Every day you rise up, you can do this. You can tap into that thing every single day. Let it flow. When you rise up in the morning, you can let the river flow. When you go to school every day, you can let the river flow. When you pillow your head at night, you can pray in the Holy Ghost and let the river flow. Hallelujah. 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 In the name of Jesus, just keep praying like that for a minute. I'm going to pray over you. But please don't listen to my prayer. Just receive it as you continue to lift your voice in your hands. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you. God, for the privilege of being in your presence, not just here, but every day. God, I thank you for the privilege of having not just the presence of God around us, but on the inside of us. God, I believe that you're desiring, God, to not just be something in our hearts, but God, you're desiring to be something that we allow to flow from within to without. God, everywhere we go, that it can touch the people around us, that it can flow into our schools, that it can flow into our dark and barren world. In the name of Jesus, God, I pray for every young person under the sound of my voice. God, I pray that your spirit would continue to rest upon them. God, I pray that they would pick up the mantle of the challenge that's been going forth to dig down deep and let that water spring up. Let it flow, let it flow, let it flow. Come on, P7 people, what you need more than just a fancy lesson or a well put together thought, you need the river of the Holy Ghost to flow. That's something that you tap into before you go to that setting. It's something you tap into in the morning. It's something you tap into in a moment like this. You need the river to flow. Hallelujah. Every Bible study you teach, more than you need to know your lesson and your notes, you need to let the river of God flow. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then before we go, can we just find somebody to pray with? We got a few more minutes for this. Church is not out in main service. Let's just pray that the Holy Ghost would continue to flow from vessel to vessel. Let's just pray that the word that was preached that it would settle into the heart of everybody under the sound of my voice tonight. Come on, pray that the Word would find fertile soil in your brother and your sister. In the name of Jesus, simple thought, simple message, powerful Word from God, I believe it. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my brother, I pray for my sister. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. He rabo rodo ye sarra mandia ye la boko sorra baha ye sheheta. Ha rabo sorra mandia ye la boko sorra batandia ye. Ha rabo sorra batandia ye la boko sorra baha. Ha rabo korya barie ye la boko sondia ye rabaha ye shukra baha.
Come on, lift up your voice and receive the word from the Lord tonight. Come on, God just spoke to us and confirmed his word with signs following. Lift your voice. God, we receive it. We receive it. One more time, lift up your voice just to receive the word of God. The Lord just spoke to us in a mighty way. On. this is what our world is looking for they are wanting the river of life they've searched in desert places they need the river you are the only connecting piece come on if you don't let this thing flow they're never going to know what it's like Of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Man, I don't know if you caught what was just said there, but God spoke to us and He said, Just like in the natural, people congregate to the water, people congregate to the river. You notice that we got a river running right smack dab in the middle of our city. It's because at some point somebody discovered this body of water flowing through this land. And they, they decided to colonize and settle down there because people are drawn to the river. Yeah. Man, I'm telling you, we got to let this thing flow. The devil would have you to believe that this world does not want what you have. That this world would not want the moving of the Spirit and, and, and praying in the Spirit and speaking with tongues and, 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 and the gift of tongues. That the world does not want that. But I'm telling you, the world is hungry for the river to flow. And we are that bridge. Come on, that's what we are. I promise you, in the Holy Ghost, I prophesy tonight that if you will let that flow, you will begin to see people to congregate and be drawn to the river of living water that flows out of your soul. In the name of Jesus, one more time, lift up your hands and just receive the word of the Lord and say, I'm going to let it flow through me. I'm determining tonight. I'm settling it tonight. I'm going to be a vessel, a conduit for the Holy Ghost to flow through into this dry and barren wasteland. It's the world that is the world. Shola la bariesa, tayerra mondo yesa. 
in the name of Jesus. Let it be done and let it be so. God, let us not staunch the flow of your spirit. Let us keep on delving into the deep and letting it spring from within. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we clap our hands one more time and give a shout of praise unto God.